Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Cooper. I'm a principal engineer at Intel Corporation. Um, I'm also work with the FIDO IoT working group, uh, and I wanted to talk to you about the technical side of FDO. Uh, I'm going to try and describe this slide. I'm also getting a little bit of an echo, so I will uh, turn this down. There we go. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about this slide. So this slide is really describing the way we thought about FDO when we first created it. The idea was, let's uh, go ahead and think about how we can remove the issue of, of installing a product. Let's say that we drop ship a device to installation location, and then we want the device to power up and connect to the, we power up and connect to the device to the network. We have the, there's an installer person there. The installer has to tell us where the device is, et cetera, but the installer doesn't log into the device. The installer just presses the power button. And now the device uh, figures out who it's supposed to connect to, connects to the right, the right uh, authority, does all of the authentication, uh, sets everything up, and then it goes right into service. So the idea is we're taking something that was a, a very heavy touch kind of operation and we're turning it into a zero touch operation. Um, well, of course, there's some touch in there, but but the the basic idea, all of the work that you were doing from a virtual point of view, that that's all removed and turned into zero touch. So I wanted to describe how we got there. So first of all, we developed a protocol. Um, and the protocol is called uh, FIDO device onboard. And uh, it actually allows a device to onboard automatically to a server. Um, we have a certain amount of ter terminology that I'll get to in a minute, but let's say the, the owner's server. So it's the owner of the device. The device is in some local location and there's a remote control guy who's trying to actually control the de device remotely. Uh, now, what does it mean to onboard a device? It means that the device gets the credentials of the owner. So now the owner can talk securely to the device and the device can also receive other kinds of credentials it needs to be able to do the task that the owner wants it to do. So if the device requires some data to be able to program peripherals, if the device requires certain credentials to be able to go and collect uh, information from somewhere on the internet, all of those things are part of onboarding. And ideally, after onboarding, the device is ready to go and, and connect directly into the user's web application. Okay, onboarding automatically. So onboarding automatically means that there's a person who's there installing the box. Um, and we want that person to, to figure out where the box is supposed to go, to tell, tell the back end which box went where, but we don't want them to actually go and program the box. And, and so this is different. Um, Richard talked about trusted installer and untrusted installer. This is the untrusted installer model. We're saying that the installer doesn't actually go and communicate with the device at all. Um, and there is actually another way of doing it. And, and um, we've actually investigated that as well. We think that the untrusted installer is, is very powerful because the installer is able to turn on a device and move on to the next device and all the devices will actually uh, overlap their installs so that their device is installing in parallel. So if you have a large installation and you want to install, um, say, devices at every room in a building, uh, light switches, or if you want to do heaters or things that, 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 that are part of the basic infrastructure. And of course, basic infrastructure today includes cameras and includes all kinds of different IoT devices. Um, then then the automatic install using this untrusted installer model is going to go faster because there isn't actually any specific operation that's required to be done for each device other than putting it where it belongs. Okay. And then, then finally, the, the tricky part is we wanted to onboard automatically to the server of the guy who owns the device. So we didn't say specifically that we were going to have a pre-existing relationship between the device or the manufacturer or the distributor and the, the place where the device is going to, be, going to be deployed and the place where the device is going to be controlled from, um, that the device is going to install and it's going to figure out who needs to control it wherever they are on the internet 
or on an intranet or on a corporate network. Um, and they'll establish the com secure communications with that entity and we'll call that the owner and we'll allow the owner to go and control the device remotely. And so that means that the device has to actually go and find the owner dynamically. Okay, let's, let's just do a little bit of uh, terminology. I've been starting to use the terminology. Um, obviously, you can pick different words for some of these things. So we say FBO, FDO onboards the device to the owner. The device is the thing that is being onboarded. Uh, you could call that a system. You could call it a unit. You could call it many things. We just, we'll just call it the device. Uh, the manufacturer is creating the device. Uh, there are device credentials that are stored in the device. Um, among them, there's, uh, there's a GUID, which is a unique ID that identifies the instance of FDO. So it doesn't last for the life of the device. It lasts until the device is onboarded. Then you get a new GUID. Um, and there's something called an ownership voucher. And this is a data item that is sent alongside the device, but in the supply chain, not with the device. Um, and this is the way that the device is going to figure out who actually owns it. Then there's the, the owner, and the owner is actually really a machine entity. It's, it's the, the server that the device is onboarded to. Um, and there are other terms that, are, that you could use for that. One of the common term, terms is a device manager or a device management service. Sometimes people just talk, call it the cloud. But of course, if you're in a closed network, it wouldn't be a cloud. Um, so we're, we're just going to call that the owner of the device because FDO is, that's the way we think of FDO. Okay, so here's, here's a view. Um, let's think about it. Uh, we have a device and in manufacturing, we've got this device being initialized with some credentials. So we had that device credential um, and we have the ownership voucher that's created and here it is, it's being sent up and we have a GUID inside of it. Uh, which is the, the unlikely GUID of 123, but it's possible. Um, and this is sent to the owner. And we have a device that is put into a box and it's sent to some place. And at some point, somebody turns it on and, uh, and, and connects it up. Okay, so now there are obviously some questions in here, right? how did this line happen if the device didn't know who the owner was, right? And how did this get, how did the ownership voucher get all the way through if the ownership voucher, uh, if, if this guy doesn't know who this guy is gonna be? If, it, if you, we don't know when we manufacture the device who the owner is gonna be, how did the ownership voucher arrive there? And then, um, so let's start to go through those issues and you'll see how we designed the protocol. And I'm, I'm hoping to give you a flavor for for how to think about these, these problems. So FDO allows the owner to change after the device is shipped. Um, and so the, the, um, the device needs to find the owner. And to do that, the device is going to uh, use another server. So there's, a, there's got to be some server that the device has programmed into it. And the way we do that is we have a um, a set of instructions for finding a server that we call the rendezvous server. Rendezvous is a meeting, right? So we want a meeting of the device and its prospective owner. And this is, um, we could have used DNS for this. DNS tends to be a little bit static. In some organizations, it kind of requires an act of Congress to change the DNS server. So we felt, well, if we had an application server, we could register the owner with the application server and we could register the device with the application server. So we have a set of instructions to find the, um, the, the rendezvous server that we're using and the owner chooses one and the device then goes and finds the same, um, the same rendezvous server. So there's a list of rendezvous servers that's in the device and then the ownership voucher contains the same list and the device will try the rendezvous servers in order um, until it finds one that it matches. And the way it tries them is that the owner uses a protocol which we call transfer ownership zero. We numbered the protocols, I apologize. Um, to Where the owner contacts the rendezvous server and registers its IP address and it uses the GUID as the, the identifier. Uh, and then we have the transfer ownership one protocol where the device contacts the rendezvous server and obtains the IP addresses. Um, and of course, when we talk about finding the owner, if we get an owner back in this transfer ownership one protocol, or sometimes we'll, you'll hear me call it two one, 
I apologize again for the name. Um, that, that Think of that as a prospective owner. And why is that? Because it's not actually authenticated yet. Um, the authentication will actually come during the actual onboarding protocol, which is transfer ownership two. Okay, um, and so this is the and so here we have the rendezvous protocol. So that's this part up here. Okay, and this piece here is really just putting these two entities together. It's saying I've got a device, I've got an owner. And it's a prospective owner. And then later, the next thing that will happen is the device will run the transfer ownership to protocol and it will actually do an authentication. So this is actually the, 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 the full, full description of what the, what, what the whole protocol would look like with steps in it. Um, you can see that you would build and ship the device over here. Um, you'd develop an ownership voucher and you'd have, have the device go into a shipping channel. The device would end up getting drop shipped to some location where it's gonna be installed. Meanwhile, the ownership voucher will go through the supply chain to a target cloud. And then when the device actually is turned on, so that this um, star is intending to indicate the device has been turned on, uh, then it will go off to the rendezvous server, figure out who this prospective owner is, and then authenticate the prospective owner. And this step six is actually after the protocol is implemented where the, where the device is actually intended to be in service running. Of course, it's up to the, 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 it's up to the owner of the cloud to decide uh, a, how much initialization you actually do. But the intent is that you should be able to do enough initialization that there's, not, um, there's no step at the device and there's no step in the cloud in order to get the device running. The device just comes up and runs. And, and so this is actually saying, look, if I have 10,000 devices and I wanna bring them all up, if I have a small amount of time that I have to spend per device, that's to explain to that device what it needs to do. Or if I have a small amount of work that I need to do when I get onto the cloud to figure out what that device is supposed to do, uh, then that adds up as I scale. And so I'm, I'm gonna fail to fail to scale. This is the IoT problem, right? Am I gonna be able to get all those devices on because can I scale fast enough? And, and so here is a way in which you can program what happens with the devices so you, you can scale effectively. Okay, we've been talking about the protocols. Let's go back. Uh, I talked about them um, in, in context. Let me talk about them individually a little bit. Um, and let's get into the transfer ownership to protocol, which is, is the, the actual onboarding protocol. So there's a device initialized protocol. Um, this is actually an optional protocol because devices have different ways in which where they would store their credentials. The device initialized protocol defines a set of device credentials uh, as long as the user can arrange for those device credentials to be stored in the device somewhere appropriate, secure, let's say. Uh, the, they can do it any way they want to do it. The device initialized protocol explains how that might be done on some devices. There's the rendezvous protocol. The owner runs the, the transfer ownership zero protocol and the device runs the transfer ownership one protocol. So from the point of view of the device, and now you'll see why we called it zero, the device does transfer ownership one, then transfer ownership two. If it fails, it goes back to transfer ownership one, two. So we thought, well, one and two kind of fit in the device. And, and so we had zero as an available number. Let's get over to the transfer ownership two protocol. Now it actually has to do most of the work of authenticating. So it will actually go and authenticate the owner to the device. And that's gonna use the ownership voucher. And we'll talk about how that happens. And then it'll also authenticate the device to the owner. And that's gonna use the, a, a key that's in the device and a certificate that's in the ownership voucher. So we're talking about now digital signatures, um, a certain number of them for the ownership voucher and, and one important one for the device to authenticate to the owner. So now you've done mutual authentication. Mutual authentication allows you to go and do something called a key exchange. Um, a key exchange is, is allows you to create a, a brand new dynamic secret that's shared between each side of the connection. And that allows you to build this encrypted authenticated tunnel. And, and that's the important thing that you need to do in an onboarding protocol because that allows you to send whatever credentials you're gonna send between the two, uh, the two sides of the protocol, either from the device to the owner 
for example, the device might want to create a key and do a certificate signing request to the owner, or the owner might want to send, um, send say, uh, some data items or a program down to the device, a script down to the device to run. Um, those need to be confidential. You need to you need to know that you got the right script there. That's the authenticated part, and it needs to be. Um, you need to be able to send secrets across this, and the secrets are key um, um, to the operation. And we call them keys, of course. Um, and and so we need to have this. That and that's the encrypted part of it. We need to have them be hidden. And then we have this a new acronym. And I apologize, a lot of new names coming in. We have FIDO. We have FDO service info modules, which um, we felt it was a little bit easier to call them FSIMs. And then we have these things that actually run to actually do the work of onboarding the device. And I'll get into those in a little bit. So let's go next into authentication. So here we are in Transfer Ownership 2. And the first thing we need to do is authenticate. We would like to authenticate the owner to the device. Um, and so there, there are credentials that are shared between them in the, between the device and the ownership voucher, which is at the owner. We have a GUID and we have a manufacturer public key um, that, will, that, that refers to the device. And we have, um, uh, I'm sorry, we have a device, device key and we have a manufacturer public key, which is actually um, used to create the device. So if we start off, in manufacturing, there is a key that was used in the, in the manufacturing station, okay? And then this, the private key for this is gonna sign this first extension and, the pri and this is gonna have another public key in it. And then the private key for this public key is gonna sign this extension, okay? So the ownership voucher can be extended. So this is the part that happens when you first manufacture and it contains some base credentials in it. It contains really the manufacturer public key and the GUID and some other credentials. And when you know the next uh, entity that's going to receive the device, say a distributor, then you get the public key for the distributor and you sign, you use the private key for this key to sign the, the and, and extend the ownership voucher. So this signature here is using the private key for this one. And then we'll send the whole thing over to the distributor. That's what this um, this this blue outline is intended to be, and the green line down here is intending to say that the previous private key signed this public key. So this is a signature chain. Um, we use signature chains at a lot of places where we need to convey trust from one entity to another. And here we're conveying the trust along the supply chain. And and I think that's really an interesting thing because. If you have a problem with a device, if it doesn't install, and remember failing to automatically install with FDO is in fact a failure of the device. If the device doesn't work, you send it back to the guy you bought it from. So this is a way in which there's actually trust associated with the supply chain of the device. And so we're actually saying, okay, let's actually make the onboarding trust also follow the trust that's in the supply chain. We have trust that we're already thinking about and let's try to use that trust to actually make this a, to actually make it easier to onboard the device. So we extend the ownership voucher um, several times perhaps to get it to the to finally to the person who wants to onboard it. Um, and then um, the 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 device, when it receives the ownership voucher, the, so the, the owner to authenticate will send the ownership voucher to the device and the device will walk the chain. Well, how does it do that? Well, this key here, this public key is actually in the device. So using this public key, it can verify this signature. And then there's another public key in here and that one will verify this signature and that one will verify the next signature. Okay, so I, I only had two here. So this is sort of the end signature. So what about this last one? Who's got that? Well, that's the guy you're talking to, right? So now you're talking in the two, transfer ownership two protocol to a prospective owner, and he's the one who can sign that. So what he does is he signs the ownership voucher. And then you take his signature and you verify it with this key that you got from the manufacturing through the chain, right? And that's what tells you that you trust the owner. Okay, and that tells you that you have half trust. You've now trusted the, uh, the one side of the connection, but not the other side of the connection. 
Okay, so let's just, uh, I'm gonna give you a little picture of how that happens, okay? So just, just to get an understanding, at the stations along the supply chain, there are private keys and private keys stay put. Um, uh, and the idea is that you can protect them and you can make sure that you, you can see them, you know that they're in a particular device and, and you know you haven't lost them. Um, and you can use these private keys now to um, create ownership vouchers with signatures and public keys. The public keys move along the supply chain, public keys are allowed to move around. Um, and the signatures are the connection between the, the private keys and the public keys. So as the ownership voucher moves through the supply chain, you get this chain of signatures, and then it's sent across using the transfer ownership to protocol and mated with the device credentials to actually authenticate. Okay, um, and I think here, oh yes, and I guess now what about the other direction? Okay, so the other direction here is easy. We put a device certificate in the ownership voucher um, and the key is in the device. And so the device signs a challenge. So what that means is that the, the, um, the owner creates a, a random number and the device signs the random number. Um, and, and that digital signature serves to authenticate the device. So, cause it's always the same device, right? So, so as long as you have the certificate for it, you can, you can authenticate the device with one signature. So now you've got trust in both directions. And, and this is the mechanism by which the ownership voucher allows you to have a given um, recipient of the ownership voucher, somebody who it's been signed over to, then authenticate to the device wherever the device is. So now we figure out how the device can actually find the owner using the rendezvous protocol. And we've said, oh, and now the device can authenticate to the owner using the device key and the owner can authenticate to the device using the ownership voucher, uh, which comes along the supply chain and uses a set of signatures, which is based on information that was put in the device it, during manufacturing. And I know for some, some of you, this may be very easy information. This is something that has a, um, analogous uh, situations in other protocols, if you're, if you're familiar with protocols. Um, or this may be something that's very, uh, very new to you. So um, I'm giving, I'm saying it a few times, and hopefully, um, hopefully it'll, it'll become accessible if you have a problem with it. And if you're finding this to be repetitive, then I apologize. Now we haven't actually onboarded the device yet. All we've done is we've authenticated, and we've done a key exchange, and we've, and I didn't talk about the key exchange very much. It's, it's off the shelf technology. Uh, there are a number of different algorithms that can be used, and we pick one of those algorithms. Uh, but, one, but we've set up a tunnel, and now we want to actually do the onboarding. And we could actually just send, uh, for example, shell commands down there. Uh, but we decided that we would have another level of abstraction. Um, and that's where we have F these FDO service info modules, or FSIMs. Um, and there are a number of FSIMs that are, are predefined. Um, and but most 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 importantly, FSIMs are something that you can actually define on a per device basis, um, and you can actually um, extend the number of FSIMs. So if, for example, you're working with a company, uh, and your company is developing devices that have very special kinds of hardware, um, or maybe you have devices which don't have a shell, uh, and that you know exactly what you need to get to onboard this device. In that case, you can go and create your own FSIM uh, and you can have your users uh, program to that FSIM. Um, so an FSIM is a little protocol that runs across that, that uh, encrypted tunnel. So FSIM stands for FDO Service Info Module. Uh, the folks at Red Hat were very nice and they gave us a much prettier name than that. Um, there are some FSIMs that are predefined. There's one in the FDO spec called DevMod. Um, and that actually gives information about the device. And it also lists all the FSIMs that are on the device. So if you were to create a brand new device and your device has, for example, a GPS device, a uh, GPS chip on it, or your device has some kind of a special um, port and it needs, to, uh, it needs to go and get an identification down the port and send it up to let you know what's on the other side of that port, uh, you might need to have a custom FSIM to do that. Um, and you can then go list that so that the, the 
module on the owner side that's receiving the message from from this um, F, from this dev mod fsim can actually say, oh, look, I see there's this other one there. Now, obviously it needs to know what to do and how to use that FSIM. And, and this is something you need to understand about FDO. FDO, we're working towards the idea that there are bases, uh, there are base levels of system that could be onboarded automatically with FDO. For example, we're, we're getting to the point now where we think that most IoT bare bones Linux systems can be can have a pretty standard way of onboarding with FDO. But IoT devices and devices at the edge in general tend to have special hardware on them. And so you need to know how to onboard this particular device. So part of the idea of this FSIM uh, negotiation is to identify what kind of device you have and to and the the owner side has to go and create a scripting that is targeted towards this device. Now, this tells you, okay, well, that means, oh, there's work to do if I have a brand new kind of device. Yes, but you do that work once, and then you can onboard 10,000 of those devices very efficiently. And so this is, this is the way in which FDO is going to help you with the problem. Standard kinds of devices you can do in a standard way. When you have special purpose kind of devices, you can figure out how to do them once, and then you can onboard them very quickly, many, many copies of the device. Now, towards that first part, we've actually recently added some five standard FSIMs as a base. And these are targeted towards uh, Windows and Linux kind of systems. Um, and they're, they're actually in the, somewhat independent of the operating system, but not 100% independent. Um, and they, they allow you to do a download a file from the, the owner to the device, to upload a file from the device to the owner, um, to run a command in the shell of the device. And obviously that would be a different command if you were running in Windows or if you were running in, in Linux. Um, and maybe in, if you were running in different kinds of Linux, but there's a certain amount of commonality that you can make work. Um, this CSR, this is um, it, it, it provides different ways in which you can get keys onto the device because we know that in remote controlling of devices, keys are critical. So, um, and, and we know there's a trust issue here. So we wanted to provide different models. So there's one model where you create the key and the public and private key on the, on the owner side um, and you send, send them both of them down to the device. And, there's, and then the owner presumably throws away the private key, destroys it. Um, uh, the, the recommended, I would say, if you go to any security person, um, including me, the recommendation would be for the device to create the private key and the public key, and then to have the owner turn the public key into a certificate. Um, and, and all of these different modes are supported. Uh, so that's what this CSR module is for. And then the WGET module um, is that we, we notice that often there are databases or packages that are pre-signed uh, that need to be sent to, down to the device. And, and the typical case for this um, would be, say, a software update. So you, you see the device there and say, oh, okay, this is a gen generic device and I have an application I want to run in it. Um, so let me send that application down to the device. Now, the FDO, FDO has a channel and you can send that entire uh, file down the channel, but the FDO channel is intended to be something that a low-end device, which, for example, doesn't have a shell, doesn't have a, has a, only a, an RTOS, a real-time, real-time OS, can still implement. So, um, so it may be that that channel isn't really as fast enough to to support the uh, a large a package that you might send down to a Linux machine or a Windows machine, and so of course. Uh, if you're if you run Linux, you've seen wget. It's a command that 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 uh, transfers a file using the HTTP protocol, and FDO wget is like that. It's saying basically um, it, the easiest way to implement it would be to say run the wget command on the remote side. I'll give you a URL and just download the contents of that URL. The additional thing you can do with it is you can actually go and give it a um, uh, you can give it a key. Uh, so I'm sorry, you can give it a, um, a, a SHA sum of the file so you can actually verify that you got the file there. So one of the problems with this out-of-band uh, transfer of files is that you can 
you don't really have an end-to-end -end guarantee that the file is transferred properly. Some of these files have their own signatures inside of them, but if you um, if you needed to, this FDO wget module would also give you uh, a SHA sum of the file so you can actually get the end-to-end -end, end -end confirmation. Okay, so these are um, the FSIMs, um, and these are the base five FSIMs. Um, and I mentioned that this, what's really on this slide, that FSIMs are an extension mechanism for FDO. And, and we have, we are ready to do more FSIMs. Um, FIDO is ready to go and define more of them. And, and you're welcome to come to us at FIDO and, and request additional ones, or um, we're actually interested in working with device manufacturers who would like to define their own FSIMs outside of FIDO. Um, and we're happy to, to cooperate with you in doing that. Um, and we can, um, uh, we're, we're working towards a framework where we can publish them. I don't think we have that framework set up yet, but, uh, but we're moving in that direction. So, so we would be happy to, to hear from manufacturers who feel that they would need special FSIMs to make their products work. And this would include um, devices that are smaller devices that don't have a shell, right? So obviously if, if we have a, if we have these FSIMs and, and they are for downloading and uploading files and you don't have a file system, then probably they aren't so useful for your particular IoT device. Similarly, if they're for running shell commands and you don't have a shell, then, then probably they're not the ones for you. So you probably know if you're a manufacturer, what would work for your device. So please come to us and tell us that. And we would love to go and create FSIMs that we think will help other kinds of devices. Um, we've actually established a repository for FSIMs and um, the reason that the names of the, the ones that the, the base five are FTO dot, um, FTO dot wget, FTO dot download, FTO dot star is because uh, we're actually interested in having other organizations go and create other FSIMs that are, that are stored in that repository. Okay, so let's summarize a little bit. And then what I'll do is I'll take you through uh, a slightly different animation from um, the, the, the diagram that we, we usually use. Um, and I'll sort of show you a little, a little bit about how everything operates in a slightly more dynamic way. And then I think we'll be pretty much done here. Um, okay, so, so here was the original statement, right? Drop to ship device to installation location. Okay, so how, do we, how are we handling that? So the ownership voucher goes to the prospective owner. That's the server that's gonna onboard the device. Could be anywhere, right? And the ownership voucher gets signed to create a chain of signatures. Why do you do that? Well, you didn't need to do that if the, if the manufacturer knows the cloud that's gonna onboard the device. So say all of the devices are going into one place, then you can just sign them over to one key and all the ownership vouchers go to that, that server. The devices can go through many different steps they don't have to go through the same path. But what if you have a distributor um, and the distributor is going to actually figure out who's buying the devices? So, you, so you, you get a pallet, the distributor may break the pallet and then send half those devices to customer A, half the devices to customer B. That's why we have the ability to sign the ownership voucher. So the ownership voucher allows a distributor to go and, and selectively send devices to different uh, users and, um, or to different supply chain entities, and it can sign the ownership voucher, so the ownership voucher is still valid. The owner, when it receives the ownership voucher, puts it on its server, and then it uses it for the, the transfer ownership zero protocol to set up the rendezvous server. Okay, so now we get the device. All this was happening before the device actually arrived at its location. So we haven't turned on the device yet. So now we turn on the device and the device will use the transfer ownership one protocol to connect to the rendezvous server. And this gives uh, an address of the prospective owner. Where did it come from? It came from this 2.0 protocol, okay? So, that's that. so now I have an IP address and this is the guy who thinks he wants to be my owner. Well, I don't know that for sure. So let me connect to him using the transfer ownership two protocol. And he'll tell me that he's authorized you to onboard by signing the ownership voucher and sending it to the device. The device will do that operation where it walks through the ownership voucher and it verifies all the keys. We talked about that earlier. The device will then sign a challenge or a, a random number or nonce 
um, that was sent by the owner and sends it to the owner and the owner will use the device certificate, which is in the ownership voucher to verify the, uh, to verify the device. And then we create an encrypted authenticated tunnel and FSIMs run over the tunnel. And now we're at the final point where we're actually saying, yes, uh, have we done it? Are, are we there? Okay, so now we're actually onboarding and we onboard using the FSIMs. And so we can download files, we can upload files, we can run commands on the device. Uh, we can write, use special FSIMs if we have special hardware. And when we're done, the device will reboot and uh, it's now in service. So if what you wanted to have was a device that runs a turnstile, your device should be ready to run a turnstile. If you have a device that you is a server that you want to actually uh, start crunching AI, your device is now running and crunching AI. So, so this is this is the got the goal of uh, a FIDO device on board, um, and and now we've you've sort of seen the the basic steps in which we try to provide these this uh, value proposition here. Okay, so let me go through it one more time. I'll do it a little bit graphically. So here we are, we're in the, the in the manufacturing area, and we're setting up the ownership voucher, setting up the device credentials. Um, so we store a device key. The choice of the device key is actually outside of FIDO device onboard. Um, so, so you can actually have a root of trust key that's built into the processor. Some processors have that. You could use a TPM to store the key. You could use some special hardware in your device to store the key. So you have a lot of latitude for where the key comes from. Uh, but it's any kind of a digital, uh, a digital key that will have um, a, an asymmetric key that, that can do um, digital signing, okay? Um, and then you you send the the owner you set, send the device credentials down into the device, and as part of that, the device will do some operations in cooperation with the owner that allows the owner to create the ownership voucher. So the ownership voucher now is only contains the the base information, and we'll we'll call it A because we're going to mark them A B C over here. Um, and meanwhile, we take the device and we put it together um, where we happen to be using a light bulb as our device this time. Um, and we have a GUID, our usual unlikely GUID of 123, which is um, with very low probability possible. Now the device gets put into a box and it's gonna stay in the box all the way through the diagram until it's ready to onboard. Meanwhile, um, the device is sent in this box to some kind of distributor or reseller uh, and the ownership voucher is now transferred over to this um, reseller by signing it over to owner B. So this was the signature using the key of A to sign the public key of B, okay? And now B's got a private key of his own that, that he's got hidden up here. Um, and he's gonna use that so he can transfer it to say an online retailer and he's gonna sign this ownership voucher. What about, what happened to the device? The device could be still where it was if he would if he had an arrangement with the distributor, or the device could have been shipped to his warehouse. So the ownership voucher is up here. It's 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 in his IT infrastructure being processed and stored, and the the device is actually in his warehouse somewhere or in someone else's warehouse, ready to be shipped to a customer when you need to ship it. So now somebody buys the device and we're ready to actually do the FDO protocol. So now the device gets shipped to its final location, okay? Meanwhile, the ownership voucher was also sent to the customer. So this is, um, you can think about when you have the, the departure scan of the device, then that's a point at which you know where this device is gonna go. And that's when you can extend the ownership voucher and send it over to the cloud. So typically the ownership voucher gets there first. Um, so here you've got a device management system. So this is our, our famous cloud called D. Uh, now, when I say cloud, um, let's remember this can all be, we take all these things and we put them inside of a closed network. They can still run FDO. FDO works inside of a closed network. If we say that Part, this guy is on the internet, but this guy is inside of a, a corporate network. This guy is inside of a corporate network that can still run. So FDO does not restrict the, the network boundaries that you're using as long as all of the entities can talk to each other. So here we have our ownership voucher and it's been signed again over to D. I didn't bother 
putting all the text in there, but the green the green surrounding scroll is trying to show that it was signed over to D. So now we start with the um, transfer ownership zero protocol. Um, and so the, the owner will now say, oh, okay, I have uh, an ownership voucher just arrived and I am available at this highly unlikely IP address. Um, and here is the GUID that I have and I'll send you my ownership voucher. Okay, so now the rendezvous server knows um, it has an entry for this GUID 123. So now at some later time, the device is actually turned on. So when I say later time, that could be weeks, could be months. We would sort of think of them as being in the same ballpark of timing, but it could be that the device was a, was a hot spare. So it could be that the device has been sitting around for a year and, and that all works. Um, the device says, hey, I am GUID. One, two, three, and I'll prove it with my device key. Um, do you have an entry for me so I can find my management service, my, my, my owner? Yes, you can try this 11, 11, 11, 11 address. So, um, so now we've done the rendezvous protocol, okay? And we're not gonna use the rendezvous server anymore. Have we proved that this is the guy? No, we haven't. We just have a, an address to try, right? The address is 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 this 11, 11, 11, 11. And, um, and so he will now connect to the D cloud. Why did we want to do it that way? Well, when you have authentication going through, um, going through a, another server, you have a bit of a broken record possibility. Um, so it could be that the server was masquerading as someone else. So you, what you would like to say is, this becomes a, a prospective address. And if the device wants to authenticate to the cloud, the device would have to authenticate directly. Um, so, so when you're doing it directly, you don't have middlemen who can, can mess everything up for you. So he'll say, okay, so now the device is sending off, here's my device and I can sign with my device key and I can show you my GUID and that proves who I am. And then the ownership voucher goes across in the other direction to say, I am the owner for that. And the device gets the ownership voucher, walks all of the keys and verifies it. And now you have two-way verification of this connection here. So with two-way verification, we can actually go and build an encrypted authenticated channel. Um, and we do that. Uh, and now we have a, a, a way of setting up trust and we start to actually do the conversation with the FSIMs. Um, so it gives, first of all, information about the device and all the FSIMs it implements. And then there are FSIMs that configure keys. And we talked about there are these five FSIMs that are base um, and the opportunity for people to create new ones. Um, and things that might happen is you might download some, you might do some work to get keys set up, and then you might run some scripting on this device um, and set up the application. Sometimes that requires that there's special hardware, special software packages that be updated on the device. And that can also be done either out of band or in the encrypted channel. Um, if it's out of band, the encrypted channel can verify it. And then the last step in here is actually to create replacement FDO credentials because we've actually sent these credentials across the, the network. Um, and so there's a certain sense in which they're not good anymore. Right, they've, they've been accepted by this particular um, cloud, but this cloud here doesn't really need to have all these guys uh, know about the credentials that he's gonna use. Say he wants to repurpose this device, he'd like to run FDO again. So what, what we do is we create a set of, of credentials that starts with D, and D can then use them to run the same kind of handshake to go further along and to uh, repurpose the device. Um, and so this means that D could send to sell the device to an E at some later time. Um, if D was not ready to use the device, but D was just going to set up the device in a certain way and send it on to an E who is actually going to use the device, then we could still do that because we have a new ownership voucher to send to E. Um, if, um, if the device was, uh, is able to run FDO, but it's not able to run its main function, um, that requires some special um, obviously some software and hardware support to make it happen, but some of you know how to do that kind of thing. FDO could be a rescue mechanism for the device. 
So we have some reasons why we could use these credentials, and now we have these credentials. If you throw away the credentials, you can't onboard the device again. So you, you have to, both sides get to decide if the device can be onboarded a second time. Now we're done. And, and what is the final step? The final step is when we're not running FDO anymore, um, FDO has replacement credentials, so it's, it's actually dormant. Um, and it can now, uh, and we're now running the protocol that you set up to run during FDO using those FSIMs. Um, and we would think of that as being some kind of a device management protocol. So we call it a DMS protocol here. Um, and, and this is the way the device would be managed while it's in service. And it obviously depends on the way that this, this entity D is actually running their business. So now we've, we're actually, everything is now local to D. All the certificates are signed by, by certificate authorities that are trusted by D. All the protocols are based on D. All of the software that's running is software that D has authorized to, to run. Um, and FDO is still available as a, as a, a recovery mechanism or as a, as a carry on if D wants to use its uh, mechanisms to turn FDO on one more time. So this is um, so that's this was my information that I wanted to give you. Um, I'll tell you, Richard. I think showed you this already. We have um, a full implementation of FDO, and I, in, I encourage you to go ahead and and connect to the LF Edge website and and see if you'd like to um, kick the tires on FDO. Uh, there are actually modules in there uh, that actually implement the pieces of of processing that I talked about. So there's a manufacturer toolkit. There's some pieces for being running a reseller. Uh, there are some pieces for being the installer, um, and there are some pieces for 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 actually running inside the platform, inside the device. And and these are the important uh, URLs. Um, I think probably you can find this top one by going to the FIDO website, um, and this one will link you over to this one, which is the actual um, FDO spec. And I encourage you to take a look at the spec. The beginning of the spec has a nice introduction that has some of the information that I was talking about. Um, we tried to write that section less in species than would usually be the case. Um, this document is available in a few forms. This is the HTML one is probably the easiest one to use, but if you'd like to print it out, there's a PDF version of it as well. Anyway, that's, that's what I have to say to you. I think I'm a little bit early, so we'll have a little bit more time for questions.